Hi, everyone. Thanks for coming. Hope you're doing well and feeling fine. I've made it my mission to keep you that way. And let me tell you how I'm doing. So I'm here to talk about a big idea. Um, and let me start by showing you. So the average person, not that people from Chicago are average by any means, but most people will only live 30,000 days. So my big idea is that it doesn't have to be this way. That we can not only live longer than 30,000 days, but we can live healthier, much more productive lives, and compress that last period of our lives, the morbid state, into maybe a few weeks. Sounds crazy, right? But scientists like myself around the world are doing this all the time in their labs, in model organisms like mice and rats and even monkeys. So it's not crazy. It's just a matter of how soon will this actually happen. And we're very, very close. Let me tell you how close we are. So I come from Harvard Medical School. I have a team at Harvard and also in Sydney, Australia, of about 30 young scientists who are working very hard to make this a reality. And if you haven't been convinced by uh, other speakers today, maybe I can convince you that we should really look at aging as though it were a disease, a treatable disease, and that one day people will take a pill that will be able to lengthen uh, the productive and healthy period of their lives. So you might say, well, why take this approach? Why don't we just do medicine and medical research the way we've always done it? Haven't we been great at that so far? Well, the problem with current medical research is that we've been very good at protecting some parts of the body, such as the cardiovascular system, but very poor at protecting other parts of the body, like the brain. And so even though we're living longer and longer, we're spending more and more of a percentage of our lives in an unhealthy state. And this is just not the way to go about improving the world. The way I see it is that we have to keep all parts of the body healthy for longer. And only then can we look forward to playing tennis with our great-grandchildren and seeing them graduate from college. So this is my mother. I'm sure all of you have people that are very close and dear to you who you would like to see around for longer, and certainly not in an unhealthy, painful state uh, or having lost their memory, as typically will happen as we get older. So my mother is a typical human being. Uh, she grew up in Sydney, Australia, uh, in a little suburb called Strathfield. Uh, she went through the 60s uh, like some of us. Um, she was very fortunate uh, to find a husband who stick, has stuck with her for 49 years, and she had two boys, uh, myself included. So there's my mom hiding in the back. But even though you wouldn't know it, my mother was the matriarch. She's always been uh, the leader. We turned to her for her opinion, and uh, she's led us for the last decades. So in 1994, everything changed. She developed cancer, lung cancer, as you can tell from this X-ray image, with a tumor the size of a grapefruit in one lung. The surgeons, the doctors said, it's non-responsive to chemotherapy. We're going to cut it out. We've, you better get your things in order. You've got less than a year to live. So my mother underwent what's called a pneumonectomy and tried to get by on one lung. Uh, so, at that point, I was studying uh, little yeast cells, uh, getting my PhD in Sydney, Australia. So here's a picture of a yeast cell. And what I was noticing was that some of these yeast cells were getting old. And this is an example of an old yeast cell. She's getting larger, she'll slow down, she'll become sterile, pretty similar to, to many of our lives. And the idea was, back in the early 90s, was that maybe we could understand aspects of aging in our own bodies by studying these little yeast cells. These are exactly the same cells that you use to make bread and beer. And I learned about a professor uh, who had just started up a project at MIT. And I asked him, could I please come study with you? And I was the first uh, postdoctoral researcher to join the lab of Lenny Garenti at MIT to try and figure out why do yeast cells get old and how can we slow it down? 
And I've been working on this ever since. Uh, clearly some of us have, have aged since then. So what did we discover? Well, there's been a remarkable um, advance in our understanding of what causes aging and how we can regulate it. And what we learned from those yeast cells that also appears to be true for ourselves and our bodies is that it isn't all genetic. It's not just about how many mistakes are in your DNA or even what genes you have. There's a new phenomenon known as epigenetics. And that's basically a term that describes things that happen uh, above the genetic landscape, how the genes are actually switched on and off. And what we found with the yeast cells is that when they're young, they have a certain program of which genes are on and off, and that keeps them youthful. But as they get older, the genes that are supposed to be on, some of them get switched off, and vice versa. And that was what was causing aging in these yeast cells. And we could very rapidly, now that we understood what was going on, we could counteract that and slow down aging in these yeast cells. So now fast forward, what is it now, 20 years? We now have a much better idea of how this all works, not only in those yeast cells, but in our own cells as well. We think that something very similar is occurring. So I have a short video to show you of what's going on inside, we think, inside our own cells. So inside each of our cells, we have a nucleus, and there are these chromosomes. And if you unravel a chromosome, what you actually get isn't just a, a string, but actually beads on a string. So our DNA is wrapped up in these proteins called histones. As you can see here, they're shown in pink. What's interesting about that is that these histone proteins control which genes are switched on and off. Okay? And when we're young, as I mentioned, important genes get switched off and certain genes get switched on. So if you're a gene that should be on in the liver, you want it on in the liver, you don't want it on in the brain. What happens over time, we found, is that as you can see in, in the diagram here, that these proteins that hold the DNA together become chemically modified. And now a gene that should be off becomes switched on. And the opposite as well can happen. So what's important about this? Well, the major implication is that aging should be reversible. If we can bring that DNA back into a closed conformation, if we can reverse this process, we should be able to make an old cell young again. And that's what we've been working on for about the last 10 years in mice and human cells. So one of the molecules that we found about 10 years ago now is or was called uh, resveratrol. I'm sure many of you have heard of resveratrol. It's this molecule in red wine. And we found that resveratrol turned on the pathways that controlled these histone proteins and the packaging of the DNA. And we fed resveratrol to the yeast cells, and they lived longer, about 30% longer. We fed resveratrol to worms and flies. We fed it to mice, and the mice were healthier. They were, in fact, seemingly immune to the effects of obesity. And later molecules that were even more potent, powerful than resveratrol, more drug-like molecules, were able to extend the lifespan of those mice and keep them healthier and younger for longer. It was a really exciting time. You can see that even Fortune magazine uh, put, a, put the story on the cover. You know, I was feeling pretty good about myself. Um, this is now 2006. Uh, I started a company that was working on this. These drugs were being developed. They were entering human trials. So here's the molecule. This is the resveratrol molecule from red wine. As soon as we made this discovery, I started taking this molecule. I figured, what have I got to lose? I know what's going to happen if I don't take it, and that's not pretty. Surprisingly, my wife insisted, demanded that she have access to this molecule. My mother, my father, they all insisted. In fact, my brother was quite upset with me recently. He said, what am I, the negative control in your experiment? <laughs> so he's on it now too. So we, we have no negative control anymore. Um, but my whole family has been on this molecule for, in the case of my parents and wife, uh, over 10 years now. We don't know if it's working. It's a small sample, of course. But we do know that it helps animals and even monkeys. So we're optimistic that it's going to help. And remember, my mother had lung cancer in 1994. And I actually came to the United States thinking that I would never see my mother again. Now, fortunately, 
she did pretty well. You can see here, this is uh, just from a few years ago, um, she was able to see three grandkids. We've got here Madeline, my oldest child, Natalie, uh, and Benjamin, who's actually just backstage here today, a budding scientist himself. And so this is wonderful. Here we have a cancer survivor that has beaten all the odds. In fact, the doctors uh, have been puzzled. How do you treat somebody who's only had one lung for 20 years? They even put her on Viagra, which uh, um, I was trying to get some for my mom on the internet. Um, and I kept getting these pop-up ads for Viagra. And I was thinking, no, it's not for me. And I imagine nobody would have believed me it was for my mother. Um, so maybe it was virtual health, maybe it didn't, but she's done, she did, did well. And there's a, a new study that we just um, put out just uh, at the end of last year, and we think we've found an even better way to activate these anti-aging pathways, to put the genes back in their youthful configuration. And this is a molecule called NMN. Its full name is nicotinamide mononucleotide, but you don't need to remember that. But what's important to know is that NMN boosts a molecule in our bodies called NAD. And NAD is critical for life. NAD is needed for every reaction, every important reaction in the cell. But its levels decline as we age um, to about 50% when you're elderly. And this is a really bad thing, we think. And so what we did was an experiment where we took old mice that were two years old, the equivalent of about a 65-year-old human, and injected it for a week with this NMN molecule and raised the NAD levels up. Lo and behold, those mice became more youthful. In fact, when we looked at the muscle of those mice, we could not tell the difference between the two-year-old muscle and a six-month-old. And we were able to report in the journal Cell, which is a decent journal, that we were able to, for the first time, reverse aging in a tissue. And we think this is just the beginning. So NMN is very exciting, and I was trying to make a lot of it so that uh, my mother could be helped by it. I thought that raising the energy in her cells would be wonderful. She was running out of lung capacity uh, in recent years. The other thing that's amazing about NMN is that it doesn't just work seemingly against reversing aging or to reverse aging, but we also have tried it, and this is from the lab in Australia, where we fed mice that have uh, induced cancer in the liver, these are livers, and we find that NMN, just in the drinking water of mice, is extremely protective against this very aggressive cancer in the liver. So we're excited about the possibility of this new molecule and molecules like it to treat diseases of aging, but also to lengthen healthy lifespan. And these molecules are entering clinical trials next year. So this. Uh, led to some headlines. There was uh, headlines about reversing aging. It's uh, certainly interesting if it's possible to reverse aspects of aging. Um, it was a great time. I, again, it was, uh, I'm very fortunate to have, have lived through this and seen my, my science uh, you know, reach the cover even of Time magazine. And it was at this point, this is not me, by the way, if you're wondering. <laughs> um, but yeah, you know, it, this happened this year, actually, and it was a, it was, it's been one of those years where I'm extremely grateful. It's certainly been one of the, the highlights of my, my life so far. It's also been one of the lowest. Just uh, exactly four weeks ago, I got this email from my father. I'll just read it briefly to you. Uh, David, I don't want to scare you, but mum had a cardiac arrest. I'm in the hospital. Actually, she stopped breathing, and that led to her cardiac arrest. Um, he ends by saying, I'll let my brother Nick sleep. I'll need him tomorrow. I'll keep in touch. So what did I do? I immediately collected all the NMN molecule that I could gather from the lab, and I put it in a FedEx envelope, and I shipped it to Australia in the hopes that it could be given to my mother to try and rescue her. I also bought a plane ticket, most expensive plane ticket I ever bought. Um, not that it matters, but. $30,000 for a plane ticket is quite a lot. I jumped on a plane. I got down to Australia as fast as I could. And my mother woke up, and I took this photo of my mom. She was doing, she was doing great. There's my father there. We're all extremely happy to see her happy and awake. And in fact, I accidentally touched a, the video button, as you tend to do on your phones, and, uh, and captured us all laughing and being really happy. We thought that my mom was going to be fine. You can tell that. 
She doesn't seem that old. She's barely got a gray hair at her age of 72. Unfortunately, that was the last video that was taken of my mum. Um, and uh, it was about 10 minutes later. She had a phlegm caught in her throat and uh, right in front of us uh, was unable to breathe. And uh, I was unable to help her and I felt extremely helpless. And all I could think was I should have worked harder. But what it's done for me is it's led to greater resolve. I now get up in the morning and I'm reminded that people only get 30,000 days to live and many of those days are not in perfect health by any means. And I believe that it doesn't have to be this way. It doesn't have to be like that for any of us in this room. And I'm hoping that our generations will be the first to reap the benefits of this, this new technology. So what is this new technology? I've told you a couple of compounds that I'm working on, but there's now a worldwide effort of scientists to try to slow down aging and improve health. We have Google investing in this. Uh, we have GlaxoSmithKline, who, we in, who we've invested. They've invested close to a billion dollars in my research. And these molecules that I'm showing you here are currently in human clinical trials. These are uh, some of the first ones that were based on the resveratrol molecules from red wine. But we can do better. Um, it's a race against time for all of us, and we may be too late for, to help ourselves. In fact, less than half a percent of the research budget at the National Institutes of Health goes towards understanding aging at a fundamental level, which I think is crazy, given that it is, it is one of the biggest problems that faces all of us in this room, and certainly the planet, both in economic terms and, and, socio, uh, and social terms. So I, I'm very optimistic, though. The technology that's coming down the line uh, just makes my head spin. The, the ability to genotype yourself, to predict your health, to be able to now manipulate certain genes in your body. Just a year ago, there's been a big breakthrough. Um, you may not have heard about it. It's called CRISPR technology. It's going to, you know, I will bet lots of money that this will lead to a Nobel Prize. We now have the ability to go into cells and just turn specific genes on or off at will. We couldn't do that a year ago. And now we can go in and we can reprogram cells so that they're younger again, and we're working on that as well in my labs. I'm also optimistic because we have young people who are dedicated to this cause. This is my son, Benjamin, who did a 23andMe test. This is a genetic test. And we were able to look at what genes were passed from his grandmother, my mother, through to him. And actually, we found a mutation in my mother's genome that predisposes her to lung cancer, which I also carry. So I think the future is bright. It's just I can't believe that we're not all standing up screaming for more research in this area, because time is really running out. But I wanted to say thanks very much. And I can't really say, can't think of anything more important than looking forward to a future where families get to see five or six generations stick around and be healthy and happier at the same time. Thanks a lot. <laughs>